All right, y'all, we back at it, Surviving El Chapo series. We're on a part four of the testimony of Peter Flores. Where we left off last time, they were about to start speaking on what prompted them to turn themselves in. So let's see what the hell they say. Let's see if they mention Sammy the Bull. And you testified earlier, you turned yourself into the United States authorities in November 30, 2008. What prompted you to turn yourself in, sir? There was a number of different reasons. But primarily, my wife became pregnant in 2008, and I began to think about our future, or the lack of a future, and the life I was living. I couldn't promise my family tomorrow, you know? I couldn't see a future with them. That's a fact. Could have ended bad for all of them. I couldn't even imagine being a husband or a father to my children, and I felt that it was better. Me and my brother were born while my father was in prison, and I just wanted something better for my own children. I felt they deserved it. That those feelings were emphasized by the next reason was an internal war that broke out in the cartel all right so reason one i want something better for the children i want something better for my family something better than i had i wanted to protect them i wanted to keep them safe i didn't want to be in prison while they were babies like me and my brother were with my father that's reason number one between whom between chapo and mayo and arturo beltran how did was an internal war that broke out those feelings were emphasized by the next reason was an internal war that broke out in the cartel. Reason two, internal war between the cartel. Between whom? Between Chapo and Mayo and Arturo Beltran. How did this war between Chapo and Mayo versus Arturo Beltran affect you and your brother? The case was in a lose-lose situation. We were forced to choose sides. What do you mean by that? They were both demanding loyalty, and they had both told us that we couldn't do business with the other. Now, before you testified that Chapo had given you the okay several years earlier to work with Arturo Beltran, did you learn something different at some point? Yes. From whom? From Mayo Zambada. What did Mayo tell you? At a meeting with my brother and I, he explained to us that he was giving us a warning, and he said, this is the only chance I'm giving you. So this is the last warning I'm giving you. I don't want you to do any more business with Arturo or any of his people and for me to seize all communication with him. And you said that that affected your decision to turn yourself in? Yes. Why? For years, my brother and I had enjoyed the sweet spot in the cartel where we could just focus on making money. And now they were like, all right, Papa, it's time to put some skin in the game. I put a cojon in. Y'all were like, nope. We're not going to make it out of this one, got to go. And that's what the cartel does. They're into telling you how to do your business. If you recall, Lupe tried to tell them, no, we're not closing. A, we're not closing. A, yeah, we know. I know you You shut things down whenever one of your boys get kidnapped and y'all, you know, close the doors and, and, and stop business. But no, I don't do that. I'm not doing that. Neither are you. Matter of fact, give me your warehouses. So it's like, that it seems kind of how they work. They're in the strong arm business. They're going to convince you to make the decision they want you to make by blood. You know, we didn't have to worry about all this other stuff. And that was about to change. You know, my life would be put in danger at that point. More danger. Now, let's not get it twisted. They had skin in the game. You can't, you, you, you don't get kidnapped a couple times without having skin in the game. So what did you decide to do? So I just decided my brother and I figured that if we were going to continue to risk our lives, we are better off trying to do it by trying to find a way out. What was that way out for you? To reach out to the U.S. government and telling them that we wanted to come in. So let's talk about that. Did you have any meetings with the DEA in the early part of 2008? Yes. And where? In, through the phone and in person in Mexico. And did these meetings go on for some period of time before you surrendered? Yes. Where were you living at this time? In Mexico. What kind of protection did you have? None. What is it that the DEA, without getting into too much detail, what is it that the DEA wanted you to do during this period of time before your surrender? To help build a solid case on our suppliers. Anyone else? And our workers and our customers? Everyone. Did the DEA have you volunteer drugs and money? But they didn't help in that process at all. They're like, yeah, go get us everything and everybody, but, uh, you know, go to Radio Shack if you need a recorder. We got nothing for you. Need to be seized? Yes. Explain how that works. How is the DEA going to build cases during this period of time while you were cooperating? 
Well, they told me there was no way that they were going to pay for any drugs. So what I had to do was I began to continue my drug business. And whenever I offered up a seizure to the DEA, I would pay for the load myself. Approximately how much money did the DEA have you turn over in this way, pay for drug shipments before you surrendered? Close to 40 million. Straight thieves, man. Everybody got their hand in everybody's pocket. Bunch of those bastards bought boats on that bread. Believe it. And with regard to the seizures that you were helping the DEA make during this period of time prior to your surrender, who would have to pay the suppliers of the drugs once the drugs were seized? My brother and I. Why didn't they just... Why didn't the DEA just seize the drugs and say, oh, you know what, the cops seized them? They could have done that, but that would have put my life and my family's life at risk. What else did would it put at risk? My relationship with the cartel, they would become suspicious that all these loads were getting seized. That would be a big problem for me and my brother. Just my brother and I. Why didn't they just... Why didn't the DEA just seize the drugs and say, oh, you know what, the cops seized them? They could have done that, but that would have put my life and my family's life at risk. What else did would it put at risk? My relationship with the cartel, they would become suspicious that all these loads were getting seized. That would be a big problem for me and my brother. So let me ask you this question, sir. Before the day you agreed to surrender, November 30, 2008, did you have any drug deals with suppliers that you didn't first get the authorization of the DEA to do? Yes. Tell us about those. Well, the loads on the train. The one we were just talking about with Alfredo Vasquez? Yes. How many kilos was that? 276 kilos. 226. Let's talk about that one first. You were saying you didn't tell the DEA ahead of time about that load coming in? No. What happened to the drugs once they arrived? I received them and sold them. You didn't let the DEA know you were doing this? No. Why? Why did you do it? While I was trying to continue with my brother and the drug deals at the same time, it was a foolish decision. It was a mistake? Yes. Now, did you hide this deal? No. Well, we just heard this recording of this meeting, Government's Exhibit 609A-10T, where you discussed this 276 kilo load that you did behind the DEA's back, right? So they were working. It was business as usual for them, as far as they were concerned. Every now and then we'll throw a load at the government until we get this recording of Chapo that we call them to come air carry us out of here while our wives crawl their ways through the desert to the border. Right. So what did you do with this recording? Did you throw it away? No, I turned it into the DEA. You turned it into the DEA, but wouldn't the DEA figure out that you had done this deal without a At the end of the day, I don't feel like the DEA had a lot of authority to be like, oh, y'all can't do this deal, you can't do that deal, because, yo, y'all ain't helping me. Y'all would just as easily put me in danger than help me. So I guess that's how they felt. Like, if these dudes ain't going to help us, then we're going to keep everything business as usual, not run up any red flags. You got a problem with it, we'll deal with it later authorization of course yes were there other unauthorized deals that you did with the dea i'm sorry that you didn't have authorization from the dea before you turned yourself in yes hell yeah a lot of deals give me another example we made money that's the business we in the heroin i picked up a couple of kilos of heroin that i wasn't supposed to when you say you weren't supposed to what do you mean by that DEA had told me there had been multiple seizures of heroin prior to this load, and they explained to me that they couldn't keep seizing these kilos of heroin without arresting someone, so for me to stop making these deals. Okay. So, that put me in a hard situation. What do you mean it put you in a hard situation? Yes. What do you mean by that? Because my brother had given his word to Chapo and Mayo that we were going to receive these heroin shipments. So on one hand, the DEA is saying don't receive any more, but you are saying your brother had already agreed? Why is that a hard situation? Uh, Because I got to move this work. Because I'm going to get smoked or I'm going to get 100,000 years. Because, I mean, the whole timing of it was delicate. The war kind of made things even worse. And I felt like at any moment, if I told, told Chapo and Mayo that I wasn't going to receive drugs, it would be weird to them. They would find that would be rare because it never happened. I was afraid they might think I was choosing the other side. What other side? 
Arturo Beltran. Then what did you think would happen? They would kill me. So you picked up the load of heroin that you didn't get authorization for? Damn right I did. Yes. You said you sold some of that? The DEA just wants to say what they want to say. They have no idea the inner workings, how it works, who's going to die. Or maybe they do, and they, they're okay with that. It's like, no, nah, you're not going to make this decision for my family. I came to you. I told you what I was going to help you with. You're not going to help me with nothing. I'm going to do this my way. And that's basically what they did. Yes, I sold five kilos. What did you do with the other eight? I had DEA pick them up. Where had you, what had you done with the eight? I had thrown them in the garbage. You had thrown kilos of heroin in the garbage? Yes. It's a dead drop. Why? I started having a little light like, guilt about picking up these kilos, and I figured, man, you know, if they would find them in my position, I would be in more trouble. So I thought, you know what? I will just have my guys throw them away. <sighs> Do you know if DEA ever recovered those eight kilos of heroin you threw away? Yes. So you engaged in... Do you know the term double dealing? Yes. Working both sides? Yes. You did that, didn't you? Yes. Did you think it was the right thing to do? At the time, I guess, but today I see it wasn't. It was so what's wrong about it today? So if it was today, you would have done something different? If it was today, you would have told the DEA, no, nah, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop hustling? And they would have smoked all of y'all. Our government is so hung up with, you do realize what you did, right? Listen, man, you don't realize what I did. You don't realize what I had to do. You sitting here saying, no, you got to stop doing these illegal things. And I'm telling you, I can't stop doing these illegal things if you want the big fish that you want. If you want the big fish that you want, I cannot stop these illegal things. It was wrong. What's your explanation? Yes, but today I see it wasn't. It was wrong. What's your explanation? I mean, it was me and my brother. We were out there alone. We yeah. didn't have a DEA SWAT team in the next room ready That's to it. come save us if something went wrong. We were forced to make these decisions split at the moment. They tell you, we got nothing for you. We got no help for you. Now they want to reprimand you and, and be like, you know, you was, you was doing this dirty, right? I, so I get that part. I get that part of them hustling and still doing it. The part that I don't get, the part that I get frustrated with the twins about is, and you know, some of y'all be in the comments telling me, oh, you know, this is how it is. That's the problem. This is how it is. This is how it is. Is why there's no old drug dealers. This is how it is. Is why dudes have empires for five years, two years, a year why because it's in every movie it's a cliche already it's in every movie the downfall and nobody seems to take that into consideration and drive a toyota to sell an old 85 toyota to sell to look down to 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 look like you ain't working with nothing. I believe there's old rich hustlers out there. The ones that made those decisions. The ones that didn't need the flash. The pizzazz. Scarface. So miss me with the, oh, it's part of the game. It's part of the game. The least you could do is try and be discreet. And DEA don't work that way, you know? They got to get permission and they have to set the team up. And Yeah, there's no red tape in hustling. It's Chapo and Mayo are going to give me this work. I'm going to move this work or it's a wrap for me. While y'all waiting for red tape. While y'all ready for signatures while y'all waiting waiting for somebody to say it's okay to do this that or the other going with that shit all this red tape and i didn't have that luxury to do that at that time you understand that was a crime sir don't you objection sustained let's keep going on that Once was you surrendered crime, or i should say i was a criminal i was a criminal that called you to tell you that i wanted out and you told me figure it out well, this is me figuring it out. Before you surrendered to the United States law enforcement on November 30, 2008, did you have some, did you give instructions to your family members to do something? To do nothing. He gave his family member instructions to do nothing. In no way, shape, or form did they have a plan to get away. But if you read right there, they had a plan to pick up money that was owed to them. It's all money at the end of the day. Don't feed this, oh, I want a new life. It's not a new life. You want to buy a new life. Yes. What? to pick up some money that was owed to me. When you say money that was owed to you, what kind of money? Drug money. Pick it up where? From Washington, DC. So you had your family go out and collect your drug debts, correct? Yes. How much did they collect? Did you ever find out? Over $5 million. And did you tell the DEA before you went out to collect this money? No. And that was your business. Your business was to go collect that money and disappear that money. Not buy Bentleys with it.
when you were supposed to be broke. Hold that money down. You'd probably have that five million today. You probably do. Who knows? My point is discretion. That's just my point. So again, miss me in the comments with the oh, it's part of the game. Ignorance. If ignorance is part of the game, you lose. Period. Even w even when you move perfectly in the game, you fucking lose. You die. You go to the joint. Even if you play the game perfect. So do your best to be discreet. I didn't give you permission. I didn't ask for permission. In Chicago. And we'll did you tell the DEA permission. before you went out to collect this money? No. They didn't give you permission? I didn't ask for permission. What about the prosecutors you were working with? Did you ask them? No. Now, shortly after you got arrested, or I shouldn't say shortly after you turned yourself in, in November 2008, did you meet with the prosecutors to go over how much money you and your family have in the United States? Yes. Did you fess up that you had millions of dollars in the United States? Yes. Did they at the time ask you how you had gotten that money? No. So years later, did they ask you then about how you got these millions of dollars? Yes. What did you tell them? I told them how I arranged for them to be picked up. Now, why didn't you ask the DEA for permission or the prosecutors for permission before you had your family members pick up these drug debts? I planned to just keep the money. I mean, that was like the money we were going to live off of for the rest of our lives. Was this the right thing to do? Objection. Sustained. Did you have a member of your family buy a big present for your wife with some of that money? Yes. Here we go. What? A car. What kind of car? A brand new Bentley. How much was it worth? 200 grand. Now, once you told the DEA that you, about these drug debts that you had your family collect and about the Bentley, what wound up happening to that money and that Bentley? It was eventually turned over to the DEA. Were you allowed to keep any of that money? Yes. How much? $300,000. Is that for your family? Y'all could have kept the five million if you'd have kept it quietly. You could have kept the Bentley money if you'd have kept it quietly. See, now they put you on an allowance, 300 grand for both families. And again, I'm sure there was more, but still, discretion. Discretion is advised. Or for your brother's family. That was for both of our families. Some extra. What about for your lawyer? Yes, and for the lawyer. That's an additional couple of hundred thousand? Yes. And your families, you said, were involved in collecting this drug debt, right? Yes. Including your wife? Yes. Was your wife ever charged with collecting drug debts? No, she was given immunity. Now, this is where we're at here. This is where we're at. They, he says here she was given immunity. They're saying now, the United States government is saying now, there was no immunity. They were not part of their husband's deals. Technically, Pedro's testifying against his wife right now in this, in this testimony. But he's saying here she was given immunity. And right now, in 2023, the United States government is saying there was no immunity for these women. And they, are, they want to put them in prison for 10 years for moving this money around. And what about your other family members? Were any of them charged? No. Here we are in 2023 and their brother Armando was charged and has flipped and is testifying against Val and Vivi, the wives of the Flores twin. So the plot has absolutely thickened. Now from the outset, when you were asked by the agents, prosecutors, did you acknowledge the roles that your immediate family had played in collecting the drug debt? Yes. What about your extended family? Did you come clean about that? Not right away, no. Why not? I was trying to protect them. Why did you treat your immediate family members different than your extended family members? I felt I had kind of fooled them into helping me and I didn't want them to get into trouble. What do you mean you fooled them? What do you mean by that? They didn't understand the scope of what I was doing. My immediate family did, you know? So, again... A lesson in watch what you're doing for even the people that you love.
because they could be manipulating you and using you in ways that you have no idea about that will come to bite you later in a way you can never imagine. Here's his extended family doing a favor here for the primo, doing a favor here for the sobrino, looking out for this, doing that, and thinking that they're all on the up and up and they don't realize that they're part of a criminal conspiracy and that the person that manipulated them into this criminal conspiracy is testifying against them as well. <laughs> Cute. Sir, how much prison time did you wind up getting? I was sentenced to 14 years in prison. How much time are you looking at if you hadn't cooperated with the government? Life in prison. Sir, did you sign a plea agreement in your case? Yes. Sir, I'm showing you a document. You will see there is a portion redacted agreed by the parties. The last page here, sir. Do you recognize your signature on the last page? Yes. Sir, do you recognize what this is? Yes. What is it? It's my plea agreement. Now, did you acknowledge in your plea agreement a number of crimes that you had committed? Yes. And that's, just for the record, that's the part that's blacked out. What did you acknowledge in the plea agreement regarding weapons? That I had obtained weapons. Including what kind? Handguns and AK-47. For what purpose? To protect my drug business. What about, did you acknowledge anything in the plea agreement regarding mortgage fraud? Yes, that I had committed mortgage fraud. What about putting properties in other people's names? Did you do that too, sir? Yes. For what purpose did you do that? To conceal the true identity of the ownership of the homes and the properties? Why is that? So they wouldn't be seized by law enforcement. How were those properties purchased? With drug money. Did you get additional penalties for acknowledging having weapons, mortgage fraud, money laundering, tax fraud? My, I was enhanced for the weapons. So with all of the enhancements that you received, remember what your guideline sentence was? I believe it was 49 or 47, I'm not sure. That's the guideline number, correct? Yeah. What was the sentence? What was the sentence? Oh, life in prison. How much more time would you have been facing if you had been charged with the other crimes like the mortgage fraud and the tax fraud case? Life in prison. I'm sorry? I could only give them one life. Did the prosecutors in your case make a recommendation to the judge to reduce your sentence? Yes. For what reason? For my cooperation. Without getting into all the names, do you know approximately how many different people you cooperated against and helped build a case against? At least 50, over 50? That's five zero? Yes. How much prison time did the government recommend? They recommended a 10 year sentence. What did the judge sentence you to again? To 14. Why did he give you four more years, sir? Because he felt that my cooperation wasn't perfect. What do you mean? The loads I had sold while I was cooperating and the money I had picked up. See, that, that the government filed for that. The man tells you, I'm going to give you the big fish. I'm going to be the biggest rat you've ever had in your life. I'm going to give you the giant whale. And then they say, okay, well, you got to stop doing all the bad things right now. Got to stop selling the drugs. No, I can't. You're not going to help me. That doesn't get me the recording any quicker. I got to keep business going as usual in order to not die. Cost you four years. Bananas. Guess it doesn't pay to be a rat. How much time do you have left, sir? About two years. So you got sentenced to 14 years and you have been in for 10? Why do you only have two years left? Well, you get good time, so. What does that mean, good time? For good behavior in the BOP, Federal Bureau of Prisons. So can you explain just what you understand? You get 54 days a year for every year, you know, you get into serious trouble. And you've gotten into serious trouble in prison, haven't you? Yes. To your knowledge, have you had any of this good time removed? Yeah, no. So you're still on target to get out in two years? Yes. Let's talk about the problems that you had in prison. Have you had some issues with not following the rules? Yes. Do you continue to have problems with not following the rules, sir? Yes. Let's talk about some of these issues. A few years back, did you acknowledge to the prison authorities about something you had done with respect to other inmates' commissary accounts? 
Yeah. Y'all fighting? Y'all y'all the Bernie made off for the joint? Y'all skimming the commissary off the top? Why? Wow. Can you tell the jury what is a commissary account? It's your comp used to purchase items at the store, like food items, you know? The store in prison? Yes. So many years ago, or a couple of years ago, we have, what happened? We have a $360 spending limit. You go through it pretty fast. Things are expensive in prison. Especially with your lifestyle. 360 ain't gonna cut it. I would put money in other inmates' accounts to circumvent that. To circumvent the $360 limit? Yes. What were you doing with that money? Living the life. Funding my own store. Excuse me? What would you do with the money? I wanted commissary. I wanted food. More, you know? For yourself? Myself and those other inmates that were helping me? Helping you what? By the commissary. And did the prison find out about this? Yes. What happened when you admitted? First of all, did you admit to prison officials that you were doing this? Yes. So what happened? They put me in the shoe. What's the shoe? Segregation housing unit. Like a punishment? Yes. Did you learn your lesson about not putting money in other inmates' accounts, sir? No. I love how the government talks to you like children. Did you learn your lesson? I ain't learned my lesson. There's no lesson to be learned. It's me against you. Okay, have you been doing this again? Yes. Tell us what happened. I received another incident report and they took my phone privileges for six months. Now, approximately how much money during a year period were you doing? $6,000. And you're again putting in other people's accounts? Yes. Was this during the time that you were having debriefs with myself and other agents about this trial? Yes. So why did you keep doing this? I'm a hustler. I'm a hustler. That's what I do. It's in my nature. I don't know how to do nothing else. I have a hard time following the rules, I guess. Okay, a couple of months ago, did you admit to the agents and to the prosecutor that you had been sending thousands of dollars and putting it in other people's commissary accounts? Yes. Did you try to hide it from us? <laughs> no, I admitted it. What happened to you a couple of days later? I received an incident report. And again, what happened? What was the punishment? They took my phone for six months. What else did you acknowledge? Did you volunteer to the prosecutor and the agents that you had done recently? That I was misusing a legal phone? What do you mean by that? Some of the other inmates that had found out that the legal phone that's used to call our attorneys and prosecutors was broken and that you could pick it up and dial out. Dial out to whom? To whoever you want. And so what did you do? I couldn't help it. I eventually <laughs> used it myself. Who are you calling? My wife. And why are you calling on this phone and not the regular prison phone? You get 300 minutes a month and they go pretty fast. So what are you talking about with your wife? Same thing we talked when we was on the outside. Pillow talk. Everything. She knows everything. Regular family stuff, you know. Were these calls being recorded? No. Now your normal calls with your wife, the ones you have the 300 minute limit on, are those being recorded? Yes. Let's talk about some other rules you broke. A couple of years back, did you pay another prisoner to put something up that your wife would see? Yes. This fool's buying what was that? billboards? Two billboards. <laughs> did you say two billboards? Florence yes. Twin style. Where did you have these billboards put up? Outside the Outside joint. the prison. Showing out, showing off. Look at me, baby. Outside the prison? Yes. And judge objection. If we can approach, it's counsel's not going to get into this, and so it's not relevant. I'd like to document his wrongdoing. Let's have a sidebar. We'll be here all day. Let's talk about it. Let's continue. Moving on. Was there an issue violating the rule? I want to know more about this billboard. I'll be looking up this billboard to see what I can find. I want to know what the billboard said. Yeah, man. The cake is uh, sweet in this story. All right, uh, where we at now? Had the opportunity to sneak away with her into the bathroom, man. Got her pregnant. Was with your wife while you were in DEA custody? Yes. Tell us what happened. And see, that's another thing. 
Miss me with the, this is the game in the comments. This is the way it is. It's, it's always going to be jealousy. It's, no, listen to me, what I'm telling you. That's fine. Don't talk to me about, man, when I was a kid, you know, my father, he was in a joint when I was a kid and I wanted a better life for my family. And at the same time, you are conceiving children in prison bathrooms, Papa. I'm not trying to hear the high road. I agree. It's part of the game. In a criminal's life, getting his wife pregnant in the bathroom is part of the game. Own that. Stop trying to pawn it off on other shit. Stop trying to play this better life shit. No, Papa. Stop playing this I want to make a better way scenario when it's the same way. You're doing it the same way, bro. And was this on one occasion or a couple of occasions? Not that you got her pregnant, but that you were able to spend some private time with your wife. Knocked her up twice. Two occasions. Were you allowed under the rules to do this while you were in DEA custody? No. Did any DEA agents authorize you to do this? No. Did any DEA agents, to your knowledge, know that you were doing this? No. DEA got a whole lot of rules for an entity that had no help whatsoever, not even a little bit. Basically a plane out of Dodge for two of them. Basically a plane to prison for two of them. That's what they had. Now let's talk about some other allegations out there. You're aware, sir, that there is an allegation that you had illegal cell phones in your... A recent allegation that you had illegal cell phones? Yes. Is that true? No. Why is this allegation does not make sense to you? Because if I had a cell phone, I wouldn't have been abusing the legal phone. It doesn't make sense. What about the allegation that you had contraband, like some sort of pills in the jail? Are you aware of that one? Yes. Is that true? That's false. It's false. So you go from a, a situation where you're this top tier smuggler and you get away with all these things. You already felt like you were, um, you already felt like you were special in that scenario. Now here you are and they're just micromanaging everything you do. You know, one pill, let alone 300 kilos is a problem right now. One pill was the stuff that they were getting picked at about. Totally different world for them too. Yes. Allegation that you were bribing guards? Yes, that's false. Those three allegations, they all come to your knowledge from a certain individual? Yes. Is there some sort of issue that you have with this individual? Not really, no. I barely know this person, but I know that he's done this before in the past with in another institution. He might have some mental issues, I'm not sure. Have you been punished in any way for any of these allegations? No. Let's talk about allegations that you're still continuing to hide money from the government. Are you hiding any money from the government? No, that's false. Now, here's the thing. It's over now, right? And at least for Pedro and Jay, it's over with, right? So if you had any money that you stashed away, if you could quietly, you know, break yourself off a little something, you you good. But to break the bank in front of everybody's face, it's a whole different story, Papa. But the government need to get out of your business now. Now they're still protecting you. Y'all got that bread? Y'all gonna have to start protecting yourself. That way the government get off your back. You gotta be on some kind of papers. You gotta be on some kind of papers, some kind of parole, something. The government's never gonna just let you go freely. It's not what they do. Do you know from someone of any efforts to ensure that you weren't hiding money from the government? You know what? Since I've been in custody, the DEA raided our houses and punched holes in walls and dug holes in the ground, and they went through some extreme process to find money. To your knowledge, were you asked to forfeit any other money they may have found besides the $4 million that you agreed to turn over? I think it was like maybe $84,000. Where? In part of my forfeiture, right? I'm not talking about the amount that you forfeited. We'll get to that in a moment. I'm talking about, are you aware that the DEA found any additional money that you weren't? No, not at all. No. Sir, let's, we'll get back to this in a minute, your plea agreement. Let's talk about some more recordings you made. In November 2008, before you surrendered, what, if anything, did you and your brother do to collect some real-time information on members of Chapo Guzman's and Mayo's organization? We continued to record conversations we were having. Did the DEA give you any devices to make these recordings? No. So what did you wind up doing? I went to a local Radio Shack and bought some. Radio Shack where? Mexico. And so can you describe what was the mechanism? How were you able to use these recordings, these recording devices to make these recordings? They're just a simple digital recorder. 
I had an earpiece with a microphone in it that I would place in my ear and then record the call. Now you mentioned that you had lots of phones, correct? Yes. Were some of these phones have a unique feature that allowed you to record without that earpiece? Yes, there are speakers. Do you remember what kinds of phones these were? Yes, Nextel radios. Maybe we can all remember. What was the feature that the Nextel phones had? Chirp. Chirp. Push to talk. It worked like a walkie-talkie. So in those cases, what did you need to do to record it? I just place the recorder on the table or hold it in my hand. Now, who is typically present when you made these recordings, sir? My brother, Jay. And what about when he made recordings? Who was present? I was. Periodically, what would you do with these recordings once you made some calls, recorded calls? I would turn them over to the DEA. In where? In Mexico. Which office? Guadalajara. I want to direct your attention to November 2008. Did you make some recordings at that time? Yes. These calls we're about to listen to, what do they pertain to? Heroin deals I had with the man. The man being? I'm sorry, El Chapo. Give us the background of this heroin deal. What happened? In October of 2008, we were summoned to a meeting with the heads of the cartel that I wasn't able to make, so my brother attended this meeting and they had objection sustained. Did your brother, were you still trafficking with your brother? Yes. Sir, without getting into the details of what he said, was there something that he had to tell you to instruct you about how to proceed next? Yes, he had told me he had given Chapo and Miles word that we would help move these kilos of heroin. All right, so which group? From which group? From both. Both meaning? Chapo and Mayo. Did your brother say that he came to some sort of agreement on Chapo's side about how many kilos he was supposed to obtain? Yes. How many? 18. And who was going to be the one coordinating that deal from the Mexico side? Alfredo, his son. This gentleman right here, Government Exhibit 60? Yes. Is it in evidence? Yes, it's already in evidence, sir. All right, so directing your attention to November 9 of 2008, ladies and gentlemen, you should have it in your books as called 609A-1T. Sir, do you remember listening to this call? Yes. And the call that you listened to in the recording, was it a true and accurate depiction of that call that you were present for? Yes. Does it appear to have been altered in any way? No. Was this one of the calls that you submitted on that recording device to the agents? Yes. Again, same questions with the transcript. You were asked to do something with these transcripts? Yes. What's that? To review them, make any corrections? And you did that, sir? Yes. Why don't we play? It's a short call, 609A-1T. You hear that beeping. Do you recognize that beep sound? Yes. What is that? That's the next tell radio, the chirp. Who are we listening to in this call? That's my brother Jay and Alfredo. Alfredo, El Chapo's son? Yes. Let's continue on, please. Where are these tapes at? I haven't heard none of these tapes. The only audio I've been able to find of the twins so far, not that I've really delved any deeper than YouTube, is is the Chapo call. I don't recall any other phone calls, so I'm going to have to dig. If you guys run into any of it, let me know. Objection, Judge. Objection pending. I'm sorry, I didn't even hear a word. I apologize. Let me see. I think we can stop it there. I think we can stop it here too, y'all. All right, that was episode 40, Testimony of Pedro Flores. In this episode, he broke down just all of the movement of the money back and forth that they did behind the D... Well, not behind the DEA's back, in front of the DEA's face that just caused them more, you know, minor problems in jail and, and in court and stuff like that. The tiniest bit of discretion goes a long way. We also heard from Pedro in this episode that he believed that his women were granted immunity. That means Val and Viviana were granted immunity and the United States government disagrees. In 2023, they're trying to put them away for 10 years for moving around that money. And now they have the older brother of the Flores twins testifying against them. 
So it's not looking good. And indeed, they had no immunity. But we see in this testimony that Pedro Flores believed that they had immunity. With that said, we'll be back with episode five soon. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Peace.